working there. And in an important position to become the partner in that firm is not a little thing, I think. Um, but unfortunately, okay, let me activate the recording. Okay, it's act active. Okay, I have uh, several presentations on Barcelona. That I just show you this first segment. Um, first, this architect who is not very well known, but David knows him very well and uh, is a very, was a very important, was and still is a very important architect uh, in, uh, in Barcelona and in Catalonia. Casa de la Marina, uh, about which I'm sure uh, David would, 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 would have many things to say. Uh, I, would, I would just improvise a few impressions that this kind of architecture, which is, uh, you know, an urban block of flats, um, you know, some people think you can't really to do a lot, but here Kodak shows clearly subtlety, uh, a sense of place. Um, it's an architecture that, that, that is contemporary, although it was built a good number of years ago, but uh, even though it is contemporary, it has a certain sens sensibility that connects with, um, with, with, with a, a flavor of what preceded it, or with a, it, it's not a brutal modernist intervention. And I think it's very well done. Uh, and, uh, you know, if, if you compare the building on the right with the building on the left, the building on the left has, uh, has uh, a nuanced uh, uh, sensibility that uh, shows clearly uh, the, the, the fine architect that he was. Uh, Ricardo Bofil also built uh, one or two buildings, residential buildings at the beginning, which were a little bit in this spirit. Uh, and uh, too bad uh, he got carried away by, uh, uh, you know, imperial, imperial, if not imperialist uh, dreams in, in Paris. Look at the plan of this building. It's magnificent. I, I, I mean, you know, it's powerful graphically. Uh, it's, 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 it functions. It is, it is both, I, I mean, artistically, it is very, very impressive, I think. And uh, also it is a, a very legitimate, uh, you know, uh, floor plan in terms of its functions. So yes, please remember this, this name, Koderk. And maybe um, uh, David, uh, uh, you know, after I make the presentations, he will show us more things about him because he does have uh, what to show uh, in relation with um, the Koderk. So you see, just uh, you, you, can, you can create interesting uh, play of transparency and opacity just by bringing in a kind of in an unusual way the, the closets towards the, towards the street uh, and uh, it works. Uh, it works. Um, so, you know, the, there are ways to, to, to dramatize a little bit, to, 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 to create a, a building that is um, more sculptural or has a certain uh, vivacity, architecturally speaking, through, in, in essence, through simple means. Now, of course, uh, the rigid functionalist might, might say that he is a formalist, uh, Koderk, and, uh, you know, he didn't have to play with his angles so, as he did, but I, I, I really find no fault with this uh, floor plan at all. It's, it's, it's a famous floor plan, if I can say so, and it, is, it, it, it deserves the fame. Anyway, I go a little bit quick, quickly because I have a lot to show and it's possible that David will, uh, will, uh, uh, will show us other things as well. Trade buildings from 1968, these are also by him. Um, and uh, what can we say? They are office towers and uh, they are a little bit, uh, not prisoners, but they belong to the time when they were built but I think they still have a, a certain fresh freshness and then there is nothing uh, to make them, uh, you know, obsolete actually. Uh, a bank from 1967. Uh, I know it's, it's, an, uh, it's, an, uh, it's a complex of apartment buildings also by him. Also um, quite impressive. I'm not sure you see them very well here. 
uh, but uh, you see them here, at least one of the buildings. And I, I think this kind of architecture is uh, very adequate for, uh, for Barcelona. Uh, and maybe not just for Barcelona in Spain, for other places in Spain, and maybe not just only in Spain. It's a fine architecture. I would say better than uh, a lot of uh, residential uh, buildings built today. Uh, please remember this image because you'll see something not too dissimilar uh, in, in, in the works of uh, Taller de Arquitectura, and even the, the, the view from the air. Now, this, is a, this was a, 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 an assistant, not an assistant, a collaborator for Antoni Gaudi, but he is not so well known, unfortunately, but he deserves to be known. Uh, Jujol or Jujol, I don't know to pronounce like in Spanish or like in Catalan, uh, Joseph Maria. Uh, and you see a few buildings. This is a building on uh, Avenue uh, Diag Di Diagonal and in Barcelona is an excellent building also. And uh, although I understood it was built uh, not quite according to, to, to his plans. Uh, but still, uh, it, it is a fine building and it is so different from, from uh, Gaudi. In a way, it is more modern and less excessive, yes. So he was a collaborator. He worked together with uh, Antoni Gaudi and, in, uh, and he was an important uh, uh, architect in, in, uh, in, in Gaudi's uh, practice. And you know, of course, the pavilion, uh, which was rebuilt, the Barcelona pavilion, um, it's not the original one, it was rebuilt. Uh, and uh, what can we say? Uh, Miss is still uh, uh, inspiring today somehow, but also uh, he has his haters. And one of the, uh, his haters used to be Ricardo Bofil, who m many years ago declared for us, meaning for him and Taller de Arquitectura, uh, Magritte is more important, he said, than uh, Miss van der Rohe. Uh, and uh, yeah, of course, it was a terribleist uh, statement, but it showed that actually the architecture that Miss promoted was not the only architecture possible. And in fact, you are going to see what else was and is and will be possible. In the, in the next presentation about the, the, the early works of uh, Taller de Architecture. I, I hear, if you are so kind to turn off the microphone, uh, thank you. Now, you know, uh, modernism and MIS also are somehow associated with the banishment of ornament. But did he really banish ornament? I mean, look at this wall. It's highly ornamental, isn't it? but it uses the, the, the expensive ornaments of, of marble and uh, here as well. So even the, you know, uh, the, 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 the minimalist par excellence, although he wasn't really a minimalist, but one thing is for sure, we cannot say that Mies didn't uh, employ uh, ornaments. It's right here for all to see in the Barcelona pavilion, uh, here as well. What, what is this, if not ornament? Of course it is ornament, but just like in the case of Adolf Loos, is the ornament of matter, of, of stone, of whatever material uh, he used. But this is extremely decorative and there's nothing wrong with it at all. Anyway, you know the plan. Um, yeah. It's funny in a way and ironical that the rationalist finds uh, some kind of uh, uh, some legitimacy or excuse even in, in contemplating the relationship with Mies. Mies was not a functionalist, really. I mean, in his work, there are gestures who are not really uh, to be... No, even here, this is a plan of an artist, if I can say so. Uh, a certain kind of artist, of course, but an artist. And also it's worth remembering or knowing that in his own apartment, Miss in Chicago, had little paintings by his friend, Paul Klee, who also taught at the Bauhaus. Also when Miss was um, the, the last director of the Bauhaus. 
The Bauhaus had uh, three directors, first Walter Gropius, then Hans Meyer, and then for three years Mies, and then it dissolved the school and he flew to, to the United States. And Paul Klee is truly the, the, the poet of, of, the, of, 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 of the painters. If there was a poet between painters, that was Paul Klee. Okay, and now let me go quickly to uh, some buildings by uh, Ricardo Bofil and Tare de Arquitectura, and then we'll go to uh, Joseph uh, Luis Ser. Uh, okay, Bofil. Uh, I will start kind of abruptly. I have a larger presentation on him, but uh, for the purpose of today, it's probably okay. So, Ricardo Bofil, he's still, uh, he's still alive uh, and doing well, I imagine, in, in, in Paris, but his architecture is not doing so well, in my opinion. But what he did in Barcelona in those years, I continue to like. At the time when he was saying, as I, as I mentioned already, that for him and his firm, his group of architects, Taller de Arquitectura, Mies was less important than Magritte, meaning Magritte, the surrealist painter. Now, look, you have a, a chance now to see his own office near Barcelona, a very romantic office indeed. It was a factory that was transformed. Now, Ricardo de Bofil had the luck to, be, to have a, an influential and rich, uh, affluent uh, uh, father with a construction company. And so uh, the young Ricardo Bofil, who I also think he didn't finish his studies, uh, he started his firm and they were very successful at the beginning. And look at, the, at the, the interiors of his architecture office. I think I would love to, to, to work in such an office, actually. And, and, and the, the archetypal um, uh, presence of the, the industrial uh, fragments of, of, of the, of the ex-factory are still impressive and inspiring. So, uh, you know, if you have such, a, such an architecture office, uh, of course you are entitled to have big dreams. And they did have big dreams, uh, Ricardo Bofil and Taller de Arquitectura. And, uh, you know, even uh, from the perspective of today, when we value nature, nature so much, and we need to value nature very much, because we need her, we need it a lot. Look at this. They did this in, I don't know, in the early 70s or late 60s. And it's still, uh, you know, this, this uh, juncture, this, this uh, mixture, this meeting between nature and ruins, industrial ruins, and uh, sophisticated uh, uh, artistic uh, uh, interiors and culture is, I, I, I still think uh, this, uh, this, uh, uh, architecture office and its uh, its uh, physical, uh, uh, um, you know, in its physical manifestation is still inspiring. But of course, he enjoyed uh, the special uh, situation he was in. That is, uh, you know, uh, not everybody can afford to, you know, purchase a factory and uh, transform it in this way and so on. But you know, uh, he, he did it. I mean, just, just look at those curtains. Those are curtains uh, meant for Roman emperors, not for proletarian, not for struggling young ar architects who barely make a living to pay their rents for a small studio. Uh, here we have uh, a special case. But at that time, uh, you know, there was uh, some kind of a meeting between the aristocratic realities that he was living in and some kind of avant-garde aspirations, and even uh, iconoclastic, uh, uh, you know, uh, longings. Uh, if we mentioned uh, Magritte as being more important than Mies, in other words, the world of the dream, the surrealism to be stepping into architecture, and they did achieve this. And you are going to see in the next buildings. But even here, you see a certain level of. Uh, Theatricality. It's 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 a it's 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 theater. It's a meeting between architecture and theater, and uh, it, it is uh, there is a level of flamboyance, uh, there is opulence, there is artistry, uh, there is a belief in, uh, in 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 a world which actually our world didn't become, and nor the, not nor what they built uh, themselves afterwards after they left Barcelona.
Uh, it was a tragic, uh, I think he married the, the daughter of the president of France, uh, Ricardo Bofill. At uh, that time, I forgot it was Mitterrand or uh, Pompidou, I, I don't know, but uh, he changed dramatically uh, for the worse. Uh, anyway, um, maybe the seeds of that uh, unfortunate change were already present, but I like very much their office, this uh, industrial romantic ruin and, uh, and uh, with a mixture of, you know, comfort. Uh, please be kind and turn off the microphone. Thank you. So we are at the edge outside of Barcelona with Ricardo Bofill and Taller de Arquitectura on our way towards uh, Joseph Luis uh, Serre, uh, who also built in Barcelona, and you are going to see his buildings, but also built outside of Barcelona and outside of Spain. Uh, and uh, uh, an interesting architect, sir. Quite a conference table, no? I mean, this is not really for struggling artists. It's for highly, uh, you know, uh, successful, if I can say so, uh, capitalists. Not everybody likes Ricardo Bofill, and especially uh, these days, but look how many books there are there, magazines and so on. I, I, I imagine it was a good time then to, to, to work for this firm. And they did interesting works and you are going to see them. This is how the building was before they, they, they begin to work on it. Uh, industrial buildings, and there are significant industrial structures in Romania as well, do have a great potential. If we can bring culture to them and inspiration and a little bit of money, yes, to, to, to work on them, uh, very impressive uh, things could, uh, could come into being. Unfortunately, a lot of them had been already the, the, the target of stealing steel and so on, but still there are important industrial um, structures in Romania. I have a beautiful book actually with uh, um, uh, industrial buildings in Catalonia. Please be kind and turn off the microphone. Thank you. Okay, uh, moving quickly because uh, I, I would like David to also have a chance to say some things and I'm sure he has interesting things to say about um, this, uh, uh, this place, about Barcelona and the, the architects uh, uh, connected with Barcelona. Um, even now there are very interesting architects in Barcelona. And so it's, it's a very potent uh, city in the field of architecture and design. I'm sure uh, the, the, you see here uh, the, the, some apartment buildings they built and we are going to arrive at them uh, very soon. They're excellent, uh, they, but, but before we arrive there, we'll see a building or two in Barcelona within the city that are not so different from what Kodak did. This is one of them. Uh, and uh, I really regret that this phase in the work of Taller de Arquitectura was abandoned. They were, I think, closer to the spirit of the city and the culture of the city and of Catalonia. Uh, this is uh, another building built in, in, in that period of time, which I also think is good. And uh, unfortunately, as I said, they, uh, they got carried away by their success and, uh, and uh, they began to do things, um, especially in France, in France, uh, quite questionable. Now here we arrive at an utopian uh, complex of, uh, apartment, uh, uh, of, of buildings with apartment blocks of flats that even today they look, uh, you know, uh, very innovative, I would say. I mean, really, if you compare these buildings with uh, most actually uh, apartment buildings be built today, they still look more uh, uh, adventurous and even futuristic because they they contain just like the buildings of john portman they connect they 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 contain two dimensions the private one 
symbolized by the, the small balconies and the apartments that of course are behind them. And then the big atriums, the, the cavities, the, 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 the spaces which say yes to, um, to, to the, the publicness of the, of the buildings. So the, the, there, are this dual, there is this duality in the buildings which I think make, makes them uh, uh, stand out. Very often, the, uh, the apartment buildings that we build neglect the duality of, 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 of functions and expressions. We either express mono, monotonously uh, uh, the, the, you know, the regularity of the apartments. And uh, now, usually, the public, public element, the public dimension is, is, is neglected. But not here, and it's done sculpturally, and uh, I think in a very interesting, intriguing way. These holes, these cavities, in the center of the building, and the access to the apartments is done through these spaces. So I imagine when you exit your apartment, or or you enter your apartment, inevitably you feel connected, kind of, with all the apartments because of this void within the center of the building. Something of a banal uh, staircase with four, uh, let's say four apartments per floor doesn't do. But here, you see, this is the power, just like in, in the case of the, the Exeter Library by uh, Louis Kahn, that void at the center says yes to res publica, meaning to the public dimension of the building. Uh, I think, I think if you do today a block of flats or a complex of apartment buildings, you can find inspiration in this strategy. And th there are modular units. They are simple. I mean, uh, they are they are inexpensive apartments here. These these are not buildings for uh, you know. Uh, uh, yuppies or you know well-to-do millionaires no they, these are almost social housings i think they are, they are almost socialist apartments i think they are excellent and you can uh, take pictures even uh, you know uh, confusingly surrealistic somehow like like this So near Barcelona, Taller de Arquitectura and Ricardo Bofil did something very interesting, I think. And, uh, you know, I'm talking now, especially to the students, they have such a program in the third year and maybe later as well, you know, apartment buildings. Well, you can do apartment buildings that are innovative, that are interesting. And especially if you try to dramatize the public dimension and then have the the, the, the private apartments kind of uh, emerge in, a, in some way from this uh, core, which could be done in, in, in various ways. Another building, um, I hear these are probably uh, architecture students, uh, I, I like to imagine. And I also think, again, I am addressing the, the, the architecture students here which again are in a, in a larger number that I'm usually accustomed to, and I, I thank them for their presence. This kind of access to apartments from ex exterior corridors is very, very beneficial. It allows for apartments for uh, usually for cross ventilation, which is a, a very good thing to have. And uh, um, I know it is avoided in Romania, but I think for the wrong reasons. I had been told that you cannot do it because of the climate. What climate? We don't even have winter uh, these days. Plus, in England, there are many apartment buildings like this. And, uh, you know, the climate is not softer or kinder than the one in Romania. So, no, it's not that. We prefer to have an enclosed, uh, not ventilated uh, a little, uh, you know, staircase, uh, very narrow and... Uh, you know, uh, no, uh, please try, try ex exterior corridors. And if the professor asks you, where did you see this? Well, tell them, we saw them in England, we saw them in Belgium, we saw them in the Netherlands, we saw them in Barcelona. 
there are many examples and you you can uh, configure the the apartment very very well if you give the access because from the corridor you can orient the the kitchen or the, the dining room towards the corridor and then the living room on the other side you have two cardinal points east west north south whatever you have cross ventilation you can do a duplex it's very very convenient and uh, and uh, i mean in terms of function i actually built myself such an apartment uh, such a building with an exterior corridor in a town in transylvania in a yurt i can send you pictures of it it's not as glorious as this one but it was not built in um, you know in uh, I, my dad was not uh, <laughs> you know, uh, owning uh, construction companies and so on. Uh, nor was communism. Uh, I, but I remember when I built it, uh, when I designed it, the, the construction company that built it said, you know, you, Mr. Coma, why didn't you make it in a spiral to, to totally ravish us? Because I, it, is, it is not uh, complicated. It's just in the corner of a street and it's curved. But, you know, they for them, <laughs> It seemed unbelievable, but they built it. Anyway, I love these buildings, you know. I mean, these corridors, you know, in themselves, just imagine coming out of your apartment and crossing these bridges and saying hello, just like in the poem by Fernando Pessoa, the tobacco shop, Esteves, hello, Esteves, the metaphysical Esteves, and Esteves looks back to you from the, I don't know what floor. You see, it's such a configuration and actually, I lived in such a configuration, architectural configuration, in an old building in Sibiu, where I was born, and with nothing glorious, no, no masterpiece, no. But there were two buildings connected by bridges. Maybe that's why I like it so much. Truly, was very, very nice with ex exterior corridors, just like I mentioned, and. Uh, you know, one, 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 one part of the building built in the 16th century, the other one in the 19th century and connected with corridors and bridges, just like here. Um, anyway, because this kind of architecture breaks the, the, you know, breaks away from the paradigm of, uh, you know, stiffness, which is so often associated with public housing. And, uh, um, Anyway, I, I, I like, and I, I think Ricardo Bofil <clears throat> and <clears throat> Taller de Arquitectura, he had some talented uh, collaborators, uh, people in his team, and uh, it was an international team, and they were wild because it was, you know, at the end of the 60s, the students' um, the protests against war, against banks, against money, and so there was an idealism in the air, and they expressed that idealism in the public housing that they did, and you are going to see uh, a few other uh, buildings and images from their work at that time. Actually, I think this work is more interesting for those who love drama in architecture than uh, most of the works by uh, uh, Joseph uh, Louis Serre. Anyway, this is the model. Even the model looks nice. And uh, you see, they worked with modules but it's not a rigid architecture exactly because it has a certain organicity and uh, uh, you know that 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 void in the center <clears throat> does a lot but the units are almost spartan uh, you don't <clears throat> you cannot see them very well although i'm sure and i hope you have much better eyes than i do um, they, they, they're really Spartan, and he, in, in essence, what they did is not so complicated. Essentially, they designed some blocks of flats, and then they connected them through the circulations. And it works. It works because, you see, you have this building, and you have this building, and then you connect it with this, and at the corners you, call, you create this courtyard, and all of a sudden you have an additional element, architectural element, which is this void, this atrium uh, with large dimensions that uh, connects all the parts. You see, it's uh, serialism. It is, a, you know, uh, there are modules and, uh, but it works.
for those who love drama, not everybody loves drama. I do. So <laughs> such buildings inspire me. Unfortunately, what they built in Paris also intended to evoke drama doesn't. Uh, and I have in this presentation, but I don't know if it's the time now to show what they did in Paris as well. You see the sections through the apartments. They are really very minimal, you know, uh, but uh, they have individuality. They, 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 they are original. They are, they, they, I think they are interesting. Maybe they are a little bit uh, small and, um, you know, they are minimal, but uh, I still think this is architecture. I mean, you look at this apartment, you know, a little corridor and then it's one room and then on another little room and then and that's about it, you know, it's, it's, they are very, very uh, minimal. But you see, even if it is a minimal unit, the fact that you are connected through a larger space with all the others, somehow that larger space be becomes in part also kind of your property. So actually your property is not just little apartment, this little apartment, but it's, it's the whole configuration of the building. So um, I think this counts a lot. Uh, I don't know if I, I, I could perhaps elaborate more on, on this or we could have a discussion about it. You can have these small offsprings of a, of a generous center and they are small, but because you belong to a, 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 a you know, majestic tree, architectural tree, if you can say so, um, you feel that it's not just the little apartment that has your name on the door that is yours, but also the whole tree somehow, or at least the trunk. Now, Kafka's castle, even the name, you know, who would give such names to apartment buildings today? Uh, not, not too many people. They did it in Barcelona as well. Here again, you look at the, at the plan and it's, it's truly, uh, there are no lost spaces here. It's, it's very minimal, but, uh, but, but the, the, the image, the, the, the final image of the building is, uh, looks luxurious and, uh, you know, op opulent. In fact, it is not. So you can create a very modest uh, architecture in terms of investment which architecturally or artistically is not modest at all. What I like about these buildings is that you have a variety in unity or multiplicity in unity. And also the fact that you have this alternation of exterior spaces and interior spaces and these courtyards and stairways and just like in the previous building. Uh, it, so it's more than just uh, putting together four apartments around the stair. So again, this is Ricardo Bofil with Taller de Arquitectura in Barcelona or near Barcelona. And we'll, uh, we'll continue with Barcelona with Joseph Luis Ser. Uh, the architect was born actually in Barcelona and then crossed the ocean at the beginning of the Second World War. And um, uh, he stayed there for many years and he was the, the leader, the director of uh, the architecture program at Harvard. And look at the look at the site plan, so to speak. You know, uh, it's it's interesting. It's engaging, and why is it engaging? Besides what I mentioned with the public uh, dimension of the, the the you know the, the the visceral spaces in between the the actual buildings, it's also the presence of the diagonal, because here we see rotations, diagonals, 
So the diagonal always, if you want to bring in some dynamism, you just bring a diagonal into the, the composition and uh, often it works. Uh, and now I, another time I will talk about Ricardo Bofill in, in, in Paris. Uh, let me go to the last presentation, which is, uh, should have been the, the, the main one, um, Jose Luis Ser, because it is his birthday today. So slideshow from the beginning. Joseph Louis Sir. So he was born. No, sorry, <laughs> he died. You see, I told you. At least I have the excuse that I don't feel well. I probably would have fevers, but uh, don't, uh, don't, uh, don't pity me. Um, yeah, he was. He died. And but it's strange because I had him on a list with uh, birthdays. Not to. I don't know how he made it on that list. Anyway, he died today, 1983 was a Spanish architect and city, city planner, where the Catalans would certainly say he was a Catalan architect and city planner. After here, there is some confusion, and I will, I will say uh, I will say a few words about it. After graduation from the School of Architecture in Barcelona in 1929, Sir worked with Le Corbusier and Pierre Jean Ray in Paris. But then we read from 1929, which, is the, which was the year when he finished his studies, to 1937, he had his own architectural office in Barcelona. So when did he work in, uh, for Le Corbusier? If he did, he worked for a few months. Maybe Le Corbusier fired him. But he claims that Le Corbusier invited him, sent him a letter inviting him to work for him. And then in parentheses on Wikipedia, without pay. Now, I know Le Corbusier was not paying some people. He didn't pay Doshi, and he probably didn't pay uh, uh, Sir. But Sir didn't work for a long time, obviously, because he finished his studies in 1929, probably in the summer. And also in 1929, he started his own architectural office, but in Barcelona. Anyway, works from the period include apartment houses in Barcelona. You are going to see some weekend houses I don't know. I mean, this description makes you feel that he 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 built 30 buildings, uh, apartment buildings, and 40 houses, and so on. <laughs> he just built a few. But anyway, uh, and the master plan for the city of Barcelona. He probably wrote this. Uh, he himself probably wrote this Wikipedia um, description of himself. He designed the Spanish pavilion at the Paris World's Fair from 1937 in collaboration with Juan Miro, <clears throat> Alexander Calder, and Pablo Picasso. Now, I don't know what Calder was doing there. He was American. He was not Spanish. Anyway, uh, but he was good friends with Juan Miro, and uh, you'll see even a picture with, uh, with him and Picasso. This was the man. He does look like a dean, uh, dean at Harvard. I think he was a good dean. He, he brought uh, art into the architecture program at, uh, at Harvard, and he did all kinds of things there. He was also the, the originator uh, of, uh, of the urban planning uh, program at Harvard. So he, he was a, 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 an influential uh, dean there after Walter, Walter Gropius. Here he is with um, the great uh, Swiss-Italian uh, um, uh, sculptor Giacometti. And uh, you see the sculptures of Giacometti in, in, in the background and in between the two men. Um, as you see, Joseph Louis, uh, uh, Joseph Louis uh, Serre was not the, the tallest man on earth. In fact, I have some pictures where he is alarmingly short, um, but I guess Giacometti was not very tall either. So in his proximity, um, Serre didn't look uh, alarmingly short. Uh, nor here near Picasso, but Picasso was also not uh, not a very tall man. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Here he is with Le Corbusier, a nice uh, soul of the shoe of Le Corbusier. Um, thank you, uh, Corbusier, for showing us um, you know that you had the real, uh, real uh, leather on your soul. Uh, and uh, on the right is uh, Jose Luis Serre, and I don't know who is on the left. Um, anyway. <laughs> I mean, the way Le Corbusier looks at Joseph Louis Serre, maybe, maybe he thought, do you remember when you were for me for a few months and I didn't pay you and uh, then you left uh, disgusted? Here, 
again, he, they are probably students at Harvard, or I don't know. Uh, Joseph Risser is here in the center, and then here is the master of the game, the one-eyed uh, genius architect, because you know probably that he didn't see since he was 28 with his right eye. I don't know what he did, but he lost the sight, Le Corbusier, in his right eye. Otherwise, everybody laughs with the ex exception of this elegant man here who, uh, I don't know who he was. Anyway, um, some drawings by uh, Joseph Louis Serre. Um, I don't have too many, but I have a few. Uh, what can we say? You know, architectural drawing, nothing, um, nothing dramatically special. Uh, this sketch is, um, it's kind of nice, but the resolution is not nice, and I apologize. Uh, here, though, the resolution is too good, uh, but you are going to see the whole drawing is here. Yeah, that's how architects draw. At least half of the students in Bucharest can draw like this. Uh, no, sorry, uh, Joseph Luis, uh, I, I, I didn't want to minimize your, uh, you know, graphic abilities, but... Uh, it's true, students in Bucharest do know how to draw. And uh, um, yeah, another sketch, another uh, playing a little bit with a golden, uh, golden rectangle there. Um, anyway, apartment buildings, uh, uh, apartment building in Barcelona from 1930, 1931. Um, I think it's an excellent building. I think, uh, you know, think about this, it's 1930s, so almost, I mean, you know, 90 years ago, he built this building and it, it still looks fine, I think. If you build it today like this, you'll, you'll make it to the virtual pages of Arch Daily immediately. Like he built it in 1930s. And it shows, it shows that, I, in my opinion, he, that he, just like with Taller de Arquitectura, I think the, the early works in Barcelona, they were the best, uh, including for uh, Ser. I like this building. And we can contemplate the, 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 the layout. Again, functional, um, clear cut, you know, nothing extravagant, but the building is, is fine. It has dignity, it has parity, it is, it is convincing. Really, if you said that this building was built two years ago or four years ago or just this year, you say, sure, it does look like it, <laughs> but it was built in the 30s. Now, uh, another, I don't, ah, yeah, this is um, a cafe or something, uh, 1933, 1934. This is also, I think, very well built. Uh, uh, so, you know, uh, so, it's, 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 sorry, it's, then, can I interrupt? Sure. It's a jewelry shop. It's, it's a jewelry? <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay, thank you. So uh, it's fine. It, it's fine. Yeah, if you look at uh, the, the, uh, the shop windows, you almost see the jewels there. Um, in fact, uh, now that I look at the name Joyero, I guess it refers to jewelry indeed. Yeah, in, in Russia, I saw this picture and usually, you know, stores with, you know, you have tables, chairs. I thought it was uh, some kind of a cafe or brasserie, but. Uh, really, why do they have tables like this and chairs in a jewelry store? Isn't it strange? Maybe they serve. I think, also... uh, I think uh, that one in particular was a very fancy one and uh, it was for the clients to basically sit down and discuss prices of high, highly value priced jewels and so on. Right, and they probably also received a beautiful little delicious cake or um, coffee or, you know. I... Probably, most likely. <laughs> it's possible. Uh, at least uh, I know that uh, it was a customer. Uh, 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 sorry to interrupt you. Uh, uh, I can shut up. If... No, 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 please continue. 
but uh, I know that uh, at least it was a custom uh, in the, the of and maybe not only on these countries, but uh, at least in Portugal, Spain, uh, was a custom to this. Uh, not that I ever attended, and I also not that old. Um, but it was a custom to for high high profile uh, customers to have uh, like kind of um, almost a, a bench to to discuss the the prices of what they were. Uh, buying there and normally it was not only uh, a person that was going there and buy a watch it was a regular customer so it was to build relationships with the customers that actually had uh money to to buy it and don't, don't forget that the the, all, the first half of of the the 20th century both in portugal and uh, in spain and something that uh, went on until the 70s uh we had uh, fascist di dicta dictatorships so Let's say that not uh, all the branches of society were going to those shops, only the 1%. So uh, it, it was for that. It was meant for, uh, for those customers, the, the, that kind of uh, wealth uh, to be spent there. Sorry. Right, right. It's just a small shop doesn't deserve that much explanation to be fair. Right. I, I, certainly, this doesn't look a place for proletarians now. <laughs> Plus, there aren't too many chairs, you know, proletarians usually have uh, one quality, that is quantity, there are many of them, but uh, here, you know, we see anyway, indeed, it is a, a place of privilege, of course. We move forward. So this is an early work by Joseph Luiser, and uh, we uh, also have the proletarians always have the chance of uh, window shopping. Right, it doesn't cost anything, and you just shop looking at the windows. They are just like you do in New York City, looking at the rich windows of, uh, uh, you know, uh, very expensive uh, designer um, stores. Anyway, sorry for this, it's small indeed, but uh, yeah, it is an axonometric of the space that uh, Joseph Luis uh, designed. Now, uh, um, Kind of a hospital now dispensary how do you translate this <clears throat> david <clears throat> it's a sanitary it's um it, it's a sanitary it's um yeah it is it, yeah. it well it's for uh tuberculosis that that one in particular right. a sanatorium yes just like the one built by alvar alvar alvo okay yeah yeah of a kind yeah this is a uh, another fine building by um by Joseph Luiser. I, I really think uh, he was excellent at that time. Now, maybe today we saw buildings like this, but I still uh, admire the, the modernity, the, you know, the, 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 he, was a, he was a talented architect, no doubt. And uh, uh, he is considered by some that he, he, he was a rationalist architect that, uh, he has other sides as well. He was versatile. In fact, uh, I saw an article today uh, describing him as a um, contra contradictory uh, genius. I don't know. I mean, even the contradictions, they don't seem alarming to me, nor, nor the genius side, so to speak. But I think he was a, a very good architect. Uh, and uh, although some some buildings don't impress me so much, but these early works I like. And uh, I don't know what he did for Le Corbusier, but in Barcelona he established himself rather quickly. Now another apartment, uh, but this is actually large. It's a complex of buildings from 1932, 1936, apartment buildings in Barcelona. Uh, you see again the, the, uh, the exterior corridors. Uh, of course, the climate there in Barcelona is even more auspicious for this kind of architecture, but I think it works. Um, especially now that the climate is, uh, is changing and the temperatures are rising. I truly think to have cross ventilation in an apartment is, uh, is something to look for, forward. You don't need so much air conditioning. You don't need so many ventilators. The cross ventilation in an apartment is, is a good thing to have. 
and it can be very easily obtained with, as I said, a co uh, an external, external corridor to access the apartments from it. And also, I remember when I built that building in, uh, in Ayud, uh, in, in, in Transylvania, uh, I, I, after it was built, I went and I, I interviewed a few people who live there and they said, we are very happy with it because we can, like these people here, we can, uh, you know, uh, dry our clothes or rugs or uh, curtains or whatever towards the courtyard and leave the balconies towards the street um, uh, free of such, uh, you know, uh, such a landscape. And uh, it's true because you have two options. You, 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 you have two corridors, two balconies uh, and two different, on two different sides of the building. It's a good thing, yeah. Uh, and uh, it's very easy to, to resolve the functions of the apartments with, uh, with exterior accesses. Now here we have uh, duplexes, uh, but uh, with duplexes or otherwise, it's, it's easy to, to make apartments with exterior corridors. You see, the access is from here. And yeah, you orient towards the corridor, the, the kitchen, and uh, you know the, the the bathroom, and then you have the living room with a stair which goes upstairs to the two bedrooms or four bedrooms. It's fine. It's so easy. The structure is very easy to do. So uh, it's very convenient, yeah, with exterior corridors. A symbol of rationalist architecture. I don't know. I mean. Not everything that is using right angles, you know, is necessarily a rationalist uh, building, but uh, it's the language that we use and the media uses. Uh. Now, the pavilion of the Spanish Republic in 1937, uh, where we learned also Juan Miro and, uh, and uh, Calder and Picasso contributed, I don't know exactly with what. I think Guernica by Picasso was first shown here in this uh, pavilion from 1937. Uh, great painting by a great, uh, great uh, painter. Uh, sorry, it was rebuilt. It was destroyed and it was rebuilt in Barcelona. Uh, and uh, Alami, of course, uh, is trying to, again, in an annoying way to tell us that it is the author of this photograph. Unfortunately, it's true they have good photographs, which they ruin themselves with these stupid Alami words spread all over the sky and the building. I hate this, <laughs> but what can I do? And truly, they have some of the best pictures. Now, uh, we look at the studio for Juan Miro, the great painter, uh, from 1955. So after the war, uh, Juan Miro was selling well, and he was able to to commission uh, his friend uh, uh, Joseph Luiser to build this, uh, you know, rather well-to-do, uh, a little bit extravagant, uh, you know, studio. I mean, how many painters can afford, uh, you know, such uh, studios? But Juan Miro afforded. Not too many people had the, the modesty and the wisdom, in a way, of Brunkush, who remained even after he made a lot of money. Of course, he, he spent his money on gold, because maybe you know, but Brunkush, in his last 20 years, he didn't do any sculpture. It's actually very interesting. Uh, Brunkush is one of the very few artists, if not the only one. I don't know of any other artist who, who at 60, stopped doing art. And uh, it's true, he consumed himself in doing the sculptures, but I don't know. Uh, he did a few sketches and a few for the Temple of Love in India and for an apartment building in uh, Chicago, where strangely Brunkush betrayed himself. Uh, maybe you know the story uh, when he built the column, the endless column, Colonna Infinitulu in Turgu, in Turgu the authorities in the city ask him, why don't you put something on top of the column? You can't leave it like this, you know, without anything on it. Put there something, a soldier, a bird, one of your birds, put something there. And uh, of course, uh, Brinkush uh, rejected the idea as being ridiculous. But what did he do some years later when uh, 
there were some some discussions about him designing a building kind of like the the endless column in 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 Chicago, an apartment building. He he put himself uh, or sketched or uh, had the idea to place on top of it one of his birds, but a giant one. So there, as somebody said, we become what we hate. Uh, enough with the, um, the wisdom of, of, of a whimsical nature. And uh, this is the studio of uh, Juan Miro. As I said, he was doing well. In fact, so well that, I mean, in my opinion, uh, this kind of studio would cripple one. I, I couldn't do art in a, in a building which is so pleasant, really. I, I need some unpleasantness, some discomfort. Otherwise, I, I, I just lay on the sofa and watch soap operas. Why should one do art when one has such a studio, really? Look at this. At least Picasso, he bought, he spent his fortunes on castles. He bought a castle, at least a castle, but in that castle was an incredible disorder. Here, you know, Miro is uh, not so disordered, actually. I don't know. I, I, even the studio, I, 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 I don't know. I, I wouldn't like it, really. <laughs> Sorry. I have eccentric uh, taste in, in my relationship with art. But I like Miro, of course, he was a great painter. And um, anyway, now, now what, what artist would commission, uh, you know, an architect to design his private quarters? Now, it's something uh, fishy here. It's, why didn't he design it himself? Uh, plus, a design that this is actually, sorry, I, sh I should have eliminated that picture. It belongs to another building. For this one, I couldn't find pictures. Now we go to works he built outside of Spain. The embassy of the United States, all of a sudden, this man born in Barcelona arrived at building the embassy of the United States in Baghdad, but it was abandoned in 1990. Uh, it's a good building. I hope I have other pictures with it. Otherwise I will feel extremely guilty. And I already feel guilty. I have a feeling I... Um, well, you see a little bit here. I, I like this building, actually. You know, it is. It has uh, vir the virtue of, of, uh, of um, um, you know, some localism, and uh, it is almost as if I, I don't know. It's something about it which uh, I, 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 I was hoping uh, Joseph Risser would continue to explore this kind of architecture, but he didn't. Um, Anyway, it is impressive for a man born in Barcelona, arrived in the United States and built the embassy, yes, in, in Baghdad, but still. Now his own home from 1957 in uh, Cambridge, because he, as I said, he was uh, uh, teaching, uh, he was uh, the dean at, at Harvard. And uh, they say that uh, the shoemaker cannot make shoes for himself. Well, it seems certain shoemakers can make shoes for themselves and quite comfortable shoes. It is a little citadel with those blank walls towards the outside, but inside is paradise. You know, look at the living room and uh, you know, library, and nice lamps and nice rags, rugs, and uh, everything is fine. Sorry, except, except uh, the resolution of the pictures for which I apologize, but please remember, I am a sick man at this moment, so I should be excused for all the misfortunes that you unfortunately have to, to, to uh, you know, witness. Um, this is the house. You see, if you become the dean of an architecture school, you have the chance to have such a house. And if you are the dean at Harvard, even more so. But you know, towards Harvard, Frank Lloyd Wright was quite acid, toxic, actually. He said, Harvard at Harvard, at Harvard, uh, uh, um, not hires, uh, uh, receives uh, uh, quite legitimate students. Uh, he, he uh, no, I have to, I have to be more careful with, uh, with, uh, with. With telling you uh, what what Wright said, he said something like this. But first, one of you has to tell me what is the difference between a, a prune and a plum. Uh, I think a plum is is the fruit as you pick it up from the tree, and the prune is the conserved, conserved, um, you know, the the preserved plum. 
So he said the students at Harvard, that's what Frank Lloyd Wright said, who was probably envious that he never studied at Harvard. He said, uh, you know, Harvard uh, takes in students, uh, you know, good plums and they become uh, prunes. In other words, uh, preserved plums, prune uh, conservate. Ah, Frank Lloyd Wright. Uh, anyway. Uh, what is this? Ah, sorry, I, I, I pressed, uh, it is dark here. I don't have any light in, in my room and uh, I pressed the, ah, this is terrible. Uh, I pressed by accident the, the last picture of, of the presentation and now I'm trying to turn on the light. Ah, this is not the day for me. Anyway, um, let me just, uh, how do I do this? Ah, okay. Just a second, please. And I'm sorry for this. So this is his house, okay. From current slide, okay. So this is the house of Joseph Luiser. And uh, <clears throat> you know, there are, there are Romanians who studied at Harvard. In fact, uh, one of them uh, teaches now at, uh, at, uh, in Cincinnati and she visited uh, even Minku two years ago with her students. Uh, she's from Ploiesti, uh, what's her name? <laughs> I feel like saying Marina, but it's not Marina. But again, you have to understand, I'm not uh, truly myself today. So uh, despite the fact that I try to joke, uh, I'm really uh, a wreck. Uh, OK, a modernist building, but it's well done. It's interesting, you know, and it's kind of opaque towards the outside. And it has courtyards, at least a courtyard. It's a fine building. Obviously, it is worthy to be dean at uh, dean at, uh, at Harvard. It works. It's uh, there is no reason for too much unhappiness. These are these sculptures by uh, Giacometti here on the shelf. Probably not. But I want to tell you a short story. At one exhibition that Giacometti had, um, he uh, the whole uh, exhibition space was empty. And uh, it was the grand opening, the opening of the exhibition, the vernissage, no vernissage. And he came himself with, you know, many other people and he had his sculptures in his pockets. And he, they were so tiny little sculptures and he took them out from his pocket and he placed them randomly here and there, one here, one there. And that was the opening of the exhibition. Very nice. Imagine you bring the, the works, the artworks in, uh, in your pockets. A truly a great sculptor, uh, Giacometti, one of the best of the 20th century, no doubt. And his brother, uh, because he had a brother, I truly recommend you, suggest to you to study him. He did uh, 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 furniture design, but with a Gothic, uh, Gothicist, modernist uh, touch, very interesting. Uh, I forgot his name. Uh, uh, so Alberto Giacometti was the, the, the sculptor and uh, I forgot the name of his brother. Both very, very talented. I will remember the first name of his brother and I will let you know. Anyway, we are still uh, contemplating the nice house that uh, Joseph Luis uh, built for himself in uh, Massachusetts. Now the Center for the Study of World Religions at Harvard Divinity School in Cambridge, 1958, 1960. Uh, another good building, I would say. Um, I only hope he didn't design that bench, that picnic bench. Um, not that I have, uh, you know, I'm very demanding in this field, but uh, anyway, the building is fine. Although I wonder what is this here? It's a little bit, um, I don't know. Okay, uh, another building uh, in Cambridge, 1958, 1965. 
this one is also, I see, I would say a good uh, modernist uh, structure. There is no reason to, to be unhappy with it. Well, from this side, I don't know. But from the, the previous one, in, in the previous picture, maybe it wasn't so bad. Um, anyway, I will be honest with you. I, I like his work, but not, um, I, I'm not uh, overwhelmed by uh, immense, uh, immense uh, liking. But I think he was a good, a good architect, Joseph Luis said. Uh, this one is one of his most famous buildings, the Fondation Met in Saint Paul de Vence in, 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 in France. Although, of course, the functionalists could ask, what are these things here? What for? Could you please tell us? <laughs> and the student would say, well, sir, you know, I saw the work of Joseph Wieser uh, in, uh, in France uh, for the Fondation Met, and he did kind of something similar. So please do not be too harsh with me, sir. You know, I, I do have in my bibliography, I have the works of Joseph Wieser. Here we see a sculpture is probably like Calder, Alexander Calder, his friend, uh, who was an engineer and became a sculptor, a great sculptor. And I recommend the, the Romanian students here or architects who are here now, there is a great book and it's very inexpensive in the, in the secondhand bookstores uh, called Calder, C-A-L-D-E-R, written by Dan Haulica, who met Alexander Calder uh, and uh, the book is about his works. It is a fine book and you can buy it with a few late. Um, anyway, but I still think these things are a little bit um, off the place. They, 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 they remind me of the cowboy hats uh, in Dallas or um, you know, uh, in Texas in the United States. Uh, they, uh, in my opinion, they don't have too much genius, but anyway. nor this canopy, actually. But I like that building in, in, in Baghdad. Um, it was one of his best. 1964, this estate in, uh, in Ibiza, uh, or Ibiza. I think when he was um, closer to the Mediterranean Sea, he was uh, better. He, I think he was uh, coming home, so to speak, homecoming. A hotel from 1969, which was abandoned, and I like abandoned things. I love ruins. Um, <laughs> so there is a there is the place here for affection. And uh, look at this. Um, yeah, you could say I have strange taste. It's possible. Um, anyway, sooner or later, almost all buildings will become like this if not all of them, including the pyramids. But it's strange while, while the, the, no, it's not strange that the buildings of human beings don't last really forever, but architects, especially lately, live forever. They, they refuse to die. At this very point, I think there is a competition between the presidents of the United States and uh, the, the famous architects who lives longer. Uh, and they're all over 90, of course, and they will go over 95 and over 100, and it's incredible. Uh, God loves architects, and God loves, it seems, the, the presidents of the United States. 1969, he stood in Westview Apartment Complexes on, on Roosevelt Island. He did some interesting works here. I like these works he did on Roosevelt Island, to be honest with you. Um, so he, he built in the new world some, uh, some remarkable structures. And these are not the typical North American uh, buildings. They, they have some kind of European touch here. There's a uh, certain variety and sensitivity of the facade, which, uh, which I think is a very positive thing. Even the, the towers are, uh, are, are well done, I think. In terms of image, in terms of um, you know architectural presence,
Okay, back to France. Um, I don't know exactly what he did here. It's some kind of a monastery or something. Yeah, uh, some religious uh, building in, in concrete. Um, a little bit less interesting than the factory that uh, Taller de Arquitectura and Ricardo Bofil uh, uh, worked in, but still, it's not bad, I would say. From the little we see through this plan and, and even the previous picture, um, sorry about the resolution here, but uh, uh, I can't always find the pictures that I want. Harvard Science Center from 1973. Uh, uh, yeah, he plays the same music that he played on Roosevelt Island, but with different materials. I think what he did at Roosevelt Island is better. This is a little bit, uh, but the volumetric uh, play is kind of the same. And apparently also he was responsible for bringing Le Corbusier at Harvard to, to build uh, the only building by Le Corbusier in the States, which is uh, at, uh, at the Harvard campus. a very rich university, Harvard. Um, they can hire any architect if they want. This is the last building I'm going to show in, in the presentation today. And then David will tell us uh, whatever he wants to tell us. Uh, from 1975, the foundation Juan Miro uh, in Barcelona. Uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, I, it can be confusing because he built both the studio of, uh, of, uh, of Juan Miro and the foundation Juan Miro. This is the foundation and all the works, the artworks that you see are by uh, Juan Miro, but this is the, the museum, the, the foundation. It's, it's fine. It's, it's a wide building. It's, uh, what can we say? It's, it's, it's fine, but a little bit too wide, I, I would say. And, um, uh, I don't know. Again, Alexander Calder, the red sculpture is by him. Uh, he adorns also some uh, public spaces in, near the buildings by me in Chicago, where especially his mobiles. This is the, the model of the, of the building. And this is uh, <laughs> a larger model. No, I'm joking. It's actually the, the building, but you, you remember the, the texture of the walls uh, on Roosevelt Island, they had, there was a variety uh, here is just some blank white walls. Uh, I don't know, I'm, I'm a little bit tired of them. Too clean and too white and too, uh, you know, uh, hygienistic and, or eugenistic, almost. Come on, Juan Miro, you are a painter. You are supposed to slash, slash, sl no, what is the word? Uh, sorry, I told you, I don't feel well. To throw some color on these white walls, as that uh, crazy painter did in India when uh, Doshi built a, a gallery for him. He, he threw, a, painted a, a black snake swirling on the roofs uh, of the building. Uh, what did Miro do here? You know, inside we have wild paintings and outside white walls. It's a contradiction in terms. Miro, if he had some vitality in him, he should have painted these white walls once and for all. Uh, but uh, here he is. He was old indeed, what do you expect? And he was already so rich that he didn't have any desire for graffiti work. And they were both, you know, well to do. The dean of Harvard and the um, millionaire painter, why would they do graffitis on the great insipid white walls of Juan Miro of uh, uh, Ser, Louis Ser. Anyway, fortunately we have these uh, photographic uh, companies that uh, try to irritate the whiteness of the walls with their name and that's it. So David, it's your turn. Do you want me to activate your, your screen? David, don't tell me you left. Sorry, sorry, I was mute. Uh, yes, uh, you, you can you you can activate. 
I mean, you there is no not much uh, left to to say. To to be fair, uh, the presentation mean, that come I... on, David, please, David, don't do this to me. You know what do you mean? I, you know you have to know. David loves to talk. If he starts, you, I'm telling you for sure, for at least until 9 p.m. Bucharest time, you will be here. So I count on you, David. Okay, okay. Uh, but to be fair, most of the buildings that you present, I, I, it's are the same that I have on my presentation. And as, all right, as say, but you know what, David? You know, about, David. I was you just know, going... David. You know what you can do instead, since we have here a lot of students from Bucharest. Maybe you can engage with them in a discussion about your studies in Barcelona and in Lisbon, if you want, and maybe say something about, uh, you know, the way you, you studied architecture. Most of the students here are from the second year. So maybe you can tell us, if you want, it's just a suggestion. Uh, how, how, how was your study of architecture when you were in the second year? I imagine you were in Lisbon at that time, no? Yes, yes, at the time I was in Lisbon, the second year. Uh, the full bachelor's was in Lisbon, then my first year of master's was in Barcelona. Well, to be fair, first semester, then I, I returned to, to finish the master's the, because it was just the Erasmus program in Barcelona. Then I, I went to, to Portugal. And uh, in the last year of the, of the master's, I also had an um, intensive Erasmus program uh, in, the, in Oldenburg and uh, yet Hochschule and in Germany. Uh, David, could you uh, please activate the, 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 the video uh, so, um, you know, we can...